Hello Trail Life, my name is Eric Johnson. I am a deacon at uh, Fellowship Bible Church in Shenandoah Junction, West Virginia. Uh, I'm also an advisor for the Adventurers and I'm also a co-chaplain for West Virginia 0356. But when I'm not doing that, I'm a farmer and I'm also a blacksmith. I've been a blacksmith for about 32 years. Uh, actually longer than that if I think about it. I first got this bug when I was six years old on my granddad's farm in Gordonsville, Virginia. And uh, he, had a, he had a broken tractor one day, and he said, come on, boy, let's go fix it. So he dripped me off to the shed, and off we went, and he lit up a forge, and he made a piece to fit in the engine. And in about two hours, we had it up and running, we made crop. So it was a good day, and it made quite an impression on me. So um, from that point on in my life, I started thinking about blacksmithing and started thinking about what it was and what it is, and gee, wouldn't I like to try that one day. So before we get going, I'm going to take off my plastic stuff because it'll melt, and that wouldn't be any fun, and I'm going to put on something that doesn't melt, <laughs> and I'll put this away, and then we'll go ahead and kind of walk around the station and explain the tools that we're going to use and some of the things about blacksmithing as we go. And uh, as we're doing that, we'll talk a little further about the history of blacksmithing as well. So let me put this away. How old is blacksmithing? Uh, fair question, but the answer is we don't really know. <laughs> a lot of people have taken a good guess. A lot of people have, have put it with the Chinese. Some people have put it with the, uh, the ancient Europeans. Um, if we go back biblically, we know that um, God gave abilities to work metal to Aaron, and we can name a few other in the Bibles, uh, other men that were using metal and were using metal. A prominent one and a favorite one of mine is Ehud. If you look in the book of Judges, um, he's a neat guy because it turns out he's a left-handed smith. That's pretty cool. I've known some left-handed smiths in my life. They're very talented, they're very creative, but they're very rare because most of the time when you learn this, you learn to use your right hand and you learn how to use your right, your left hand or your, your strong hand to guide your tools to make your cuts and your punches. Um, but Ehud is a neat guy to me because um, he actually made the iron and made it right there. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't go into full detail, but I can get the picture of it. He was surrounded by a culture of people at that time who understood metal. Uh, it's kind of an interesting story too because if you remember, um, the, the Palestinians had grabbed up all the, all the blacksmiths and all the smiths and hauled them out to Gaza because they didn't want the Israelis, the Israelites, I'm sorry, to, to be able to make weapons of war. So Israel had to literally go to Philistia and, and, and they had to get their plows and their implements to farm with from the Philistines. Uh, but Ehud changed that. Well, let's, let's go through some things. Uh, as we, we get into this a little bit here. Uh, in front of me I have my main tool. This is my anvil. Okay, I, I polished it for you today. I hope you like it. It doesn't usually look that nice. <laughs> it's, it's usually covered with dirt and speck and grime and I wipe it off the end of the day. But uh, I wanted you to see the parts and pieces of it. The blacksmith shop consists of usually a flat piece of metal that you can work on. You have to be able to work your metal on top of a nice flat piece. Actually, the smoother it is, the better it is for the finish of your metal when you're done. Um, this is called a London pattern anvil. It has a square hole in it called the hardy hole, a round hole called the pritchel. The top we call the table. Okay, Moving down, there's a little table that benches down. That's your cutting table. That's actually soft. And then moving from there, you've got a round horn. That's called the beaker, the, the uh, horn by a lot of blacksmiths. So that's my main tool. Um, in my hand is my favorite hammer. It's pretty beaten up, pretty bashed up. I use it every day. It's called a cross peen or a Swedish style blacksmith hammer. Uh, it's got a, a beveled face. It's got a tapered peen. In a minute I'm going to show you how to use that. Uh, when I teach students here, and by the way, you're in my outdoor student classroom. This is where I do my teaching. Um, I teach everybody to use every part of your hammer and every part of the anvil that you can when you're working with iron. Don't neglect any part of it. You can use it all. And to my left, if I need to grab something in a hurry, I have my vise. 
of post vise. I can also work hot metal with it. You notice it's got a big long leg on it. That's so that when I stick something hot in and I hit it, all the action goes down to the base and it doesn't destroy the jaws. Um, traditionally, blacksmiths would make this. They'd make their hammers. They'd make all their tools. Um, not usually the anvil. Usually anvils were made by teams of blacksmiths because it's, it's heavy. It takes two to three guys to horse this thing around and get it in a fire and out of a fire before they can make it. So one guy is not going to make an anvil, not that easily. Um, all the tools you see here that I have mounted, these are my tongs to grab things with. Uh, I've got another hammer or two. I've got some cutting tools, some punching tools, some odd shaped tools that make things turn round from square. They're called swedges. And uh, this is a basic, basic setup. Now walk backwards and we'll show you the forge. I'm turning the handle of what's called a bellows. Bellows captures air from the outdoors and it brings air up through the bottom into something called the tuir, which is like a vent. I've got a lit fire, and so the more air that I add, the hotter the fire gets. So what we're going to do is bring the fire up to work in heat. Now, in case you're wondering, COVID-19 does not like fire. So it's a good place to be if you're fighting off the COVID. Um, viruses don't do well with fire. I like that. I'm sure you would like that. If you want to try this at home, be careful. <laughs> in fact, I don't want you to try this at home unless you've got somebody there who knows how to do this along with you. Don't but, try this at home, kids. <laughs> What we do have is our tro troop master with us today. This is Mr. Neal. And Mr. Neal is also, uh, he's a journeyman blacksmith. He's worked with me some. So we're going to kind of do some things today where uh, when I do it in iron, you're going to get to watch him do it in clay. We kind of want you to and invite you to take a piece of clay or Play-Doh maybe and try the same thing with a hammer just to see what it feels like under your hammer, how you can move material around. So, this is the bellows that brings the air into the, the forge. This is the main forge. Uh, today I am burning what's called coke. I'll put a little bit in my hand. It looks uh, kind of spongy, but it's really cold. It's burned down and, and turned into uh, really, really light material. Uh, sometimes it's called breeze in the old days. It all comes from soft coal. We're using that. Uh, historically, before they, they got into coal, the blacksmiths would use charcoal. In biblical times, on up to the, the 18th century, there were people who would go out into the woods and harvest hardwood. They would cut it and burn it partially, and then put the fire out, save it, and you got a really nice light material to burn. Charcoal makes a really, really nice fire. It's very clean, not very dirty. Uh, a lot of people who forge knives use charcoal because it doesn't get very many impurities in the steel or the metal. And that can be important when you're making tools. And speaking of historical things that blacksmiths would make, I drug some of that out. I brought a what is it box today. Uh, so let me dig through the box and show you some stuff. All of it is old. All of it is at least 150 years old. Some of it is 300 years old. Um, now, we'll start with the obvious thing on top. This is a 350 year old Damascus steel shotgun barrel made in the land of the Hittites, Turkey, by a Turkish blacksmith. If you look at it close, you see the lines where he welded it. This is all done, wrapping the metal, welding it a little bit at a time in a forge and fire. So I thought you'd like to see that. Uh, let's see. What we have here a nice big broad axe. The blacksmith in olden times is the person who would make your tools for you. This is what you would cut wood with, and you could make your wood flat. If your wood is round, you want to build a log cabin or something, you would use this special axe to do that with. It's a broad axe. Let's see what else we can find in the what is it box. Ah, uh, bet you know what that is. And if you don't, I uh, bet your mom or your dad might know. If they don't, grandpa or grandpa might know. <laughs> uh, 
This is a tool called a scythe. It's a blade. Yeah, it's a good grass, cutting hay, cutting straw, cutting anything else you want to cut down. Uh, Smiths make these too. Made out of high carbon steel. Let's see, one more item. Uh, bring out the best and then we'll get, get lit up. In the bottom of my box, I've got something that dates to 1728. I know it because I got the bill of sale. It was made for somebody in Mecklenburg, Virginia, which used to be. Well, actually, that's the name, the old name for Shepherdstown. But it was handmade by the Sheets Blacksmith Factory. And each one of these links is handmade, hand forged, hand welded. And this hook is also forged welded. Everything about it, if you look at it, I counted it one night, there are over 400 welds in this piece. This is a hallmark piece, it's a beautiful piece of work. But it's designed so that uh, you could hook this to one horse or one mule, or this to the other mule or the other horse. You could hook that up to a log or something, or whatever it was you wanted to drag, and drag it along with you. Wagon, log, piece of ice, something like that. So I thought you might enjoy seeing that. All right. So we'll leave the what is it box alone for now. Let's go ahead and bring the fire up. Uh, maybe Mr. Neal will get a piece of clay, and we're going to start making some stuff. So I was thinking about what you might make if uh, you had the chance to, to make some things, let's say for your crew. Um, and if any of you guys ever like to cook over an open fire, well, sometimes it's handy to have a hook that you might hook a lot from. So I'm going to go ahead and make a hook today. I'll grab a piece of stock while Mr. Neal's getting his clay ready. And then we'll also put the board fill. got a piece of scrap. Most blacksmith shops that you go to have a big scrap pile. Um, there's a good reason for that. You can always use a piece of metal. You never ever throw away metal if you can help it. Uh, at least all the blacksmith shops I've worked in over the years, nobody ever threw away the metal. Uh, there are stories about doing that, but you know, sometimes I'll be making a, ga a gate or a railing or something for somebody's house. I've got to have just a certain piece of metal, just the right size. Um, and I go looking at my scrap pile, and right there it is. All I have to do is take it, heat it, change it, forge it, and make it into what I want to do. So, what we're using today is mild steel. Uh, it, it, it doesn't have very much carbon in it. It's about the softest steel that you can use. The original metal that blacksmiths would use was called wrought iron. It was extremely workable, very, very easy to make it work, very easy to bend it, very easy to weld it, and not a high carbon content. Steel is uh, an outgrowth of wrought iron. It's the wrought iron plus carbon, and you end up with something else. Um, there are different grades of steel, some harder than others. Uh, we're not going to use blade steel today. If you would make an axe or any of those tools out of it, we're just going to use something soft so that uh, we can we can show you how you can work this stuff. So I'm going to take a piece of this 3 8 round and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what every blacksmith has done for 3,000 years or more. Stick it in a fire. I'm going to heat it up. As you heat it, what happens is um, when things are heated, they expand. Uh, molecules ex start dancing around. Bonds are broken chemically. You can't see that with your eye, but I can tell you that's what happens. And in metal world and blacksmithing world, we might call that uh, a state of plastic. It isn't really plastic, it's just the term for it. Now the metal becomes soft and workable. So now we are at a black heat. That's about 800 degrees. Fahrenheit, by the way. I'm going to speak in terms of Fahrenheit. I won't do Celsius today. We're going to take it up. I'll show you what a thousand looks like. Oop. Well, the brown tip on the end is about a thousand. The red, the cherry red, is about 1,200. Let's see if we can get it up to about 2,800 Fahrenheit. Yep. Oh, 
almost there. So, Mr. Johnson, what do the colors of the mild steel depict as far as the temperature? Well, what we want to do is get this piece up to uh, forgeability. Now, to forge, the word means forge means to move metal, change its shape. Uh, and in the old terms, you would, you would, if we were in, in uh, the medieval times, you would say we were going to smite this piece of metal. Smite means to hit it. Uh, when we hit it, we're going to make it move. So when we get to yellow, we're going to be about 2800 Fahrenheit, which is where I want to be when I start to actually use my camera. thing I'm going to do is just color what's called drawing a taper. So I'm going to lay it on the anvil. I'm going to draw. And you can see my hammer is kind of slanted and it moves this way when I do that. And that's a really gentle trick taper. Okay, That's not a very fast taper. If we want to make this move really fast, we use the round part of the anvil and we do this. Goodness, that looks like a nail, doesn't it? Okay, so that's that's how you draw a fast taper in a piece of metal. Uh, you can do that by using the flat of your, your hammer. You can also use the round edge of your anvil to make your metal move a little faster. Okay, it's a sharp fuller. All right, so we did that. Gosh, what else can we do? Let's go ahead and let's start our hook. So I'm going to make a rat tail. And this is a great exercise if you're just learning how to do this. So you draw to a taper. That's what I did the first part of this. And we're going to get it real pointy, and then we're going to make our rat tail. You don't have to do this if you're making a hook with it, but it's a nice way to dress it off. And it keeps it from being sharp, and it, it doesn't poke you in the hand when you use it. And a lot of the things that you make when you're making things for people, you want to think about safety. You want to think about how practical it is to use. And blacksmiths have thought about that for centuries. So we do pretty much the same thing. Here we go. Drawing it out again. And now we're going to round it from square to round. And we're going to roll it. Okay, now it's round. Here it was square. We went from round to square. Now we went back to round. And our next step is we're going to make this dance around. We're going to actually make a rat tail on it. These are all really simple things you can do with Play-Doh. If you've got a block of, of clay at home. Uh, when I teach classes sometimes to people, I take something called plasticine, which is glorified Play-Doh. <laughs> and you, you have a student make a long string of, of clay. It's about the shape and the size that you're working on. And you have them do everything with the same hammer that you use on the end. And it's a great way to teach because you don't have to hit it as hard. You get to see where your hammer lands. And you get to see the impression that your hammer makes. Now we're going to roll the eye down, turn it over, bring it in. Rat tail. Okay, so that, that's a, a hand. Let's pull that off so you can see it a little bit better. Now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll cut an end off of this. We'll make a rather short hook. And uh, we will uh, we'll heat that again and we'll turn it around the beak. With a horn, we'll show you how to make your first hook. And we'll make another hook on the other end. And we'll make what's called an S hook today. Back in the fire. And this time, we're going to cut it. Now, we cut metal. We can cut it a lot of different ways. We can use this. This is called a hot cut chisel. Or we can use this, which is what we're going to do. This is called a hardy. Remember I told you about the hardy hole? I don't, don't mind my bird back there. He's doing his job. i got a peacock. 
Um, we stick our hurdy in the anvil and we're ready to cut steel. Okay. Now I'm going to get a pair of tongs so that I can hold the metal when I cut it. And uh, after we've done that, then we can finish the other heat. So let's draw another heat. Up she comes. Historically, they've become a blacksmith, at least for 1,200 years that I know of. You went through something called an apprenticeship. Um, usually your parents would start you doing this at age 10 or 11. And they would kind of uh, assign you to or grant you to uh, a craftsman, somebody like a blacksmith or a carpenter or a cooper. Uh, and that person would kind of take you into their home, feed you your meals, uh, give you your school lessons, and uh, teach you the trade. And you would work with that person for about 10 years. And at the end of those 10 years, if you'd done well, you would graduate to the next level, and that level is called journeyman. Uh, as a journeyman, you would be somewhere close to 20 years old, a little bit beyond it maybe. And you could either stay there and work for another five to seven years with that same craftsman, or you could move on and go to another shop and work with another one until you got really, really good. Um, traditionally, at the end of that time, say about 15 years down the line, you would have been good enough to have uh, gone to the guild. There were a group of artisans, the same type of artisan, and you would go to them and you'd say, I want to become a master of the craft. To do that, uh, they would say, okay, you have to plan and make something called a masterpiece. And if you planned it and if you made it, you would bring it to them, they would look at it and examine it. If your work was flawless in their eyes, in their opinion, you became a master of the craft. In this case, a master blacksmith. So there was a lot of time invested in learning this trade historically. And um, to do it, to do it well, um, you really do need to invest a lot of time in it. We're ready to cut, and we're going to cut this a little bit cooler than we started to forge it. So we're about 2,600 right now. We'll go ahead and cut that there. And yep, there it goes. So we'll cool that. Stick that in the coal bucket. Okay, now we have our piece to finish. And we're going to go back up here, grab the rat tail, and we're going to rat tail the other end. Okay. We'll go back in the fire and heat that up to do the same thing. Remember what we're going to do? We're going to draw, draw to a taper. Then after we've tapered it, we're going to round it. And after we round it, we're going to make the eye. Um, so, we do burn coal today. A lot of blacksmiths, me included, use uh, gas forges. We use liquid propane. We use uh, methane gas sometimes. Uh, it depends on what, what you're doing, what kind of work you're doing. I do lots of historical reproduction work, so I use coal because I want the same effect. And a lot of times I can actually uh, make my piece a little better if I'm working on tool steel if I use charcoal instead of a gas compound. Um, gas tends to, to kind of rob carbon from your steel and makes it scaly and soft. Um, if you want something with a little more carbon in it, actually, uh, if you're, you're working it in a coal fire, you're going to gain carbon as you go. So here we are ready to go. So again, we're going to draw to a taper using the handle. I showed you the first time. Just reducing the stock and what did I call that? Fullering. Now we can fuller and taper. Here we are. Now when you work a little closer. Uh, what I teach my students is to use each part of your hammer. I think I mentioned that. You get your power swing by going back to this portion of the handle. 
uh, a good hammer handle is designed, it's not just done haphazardly. Uh, you notice there's a graduation, it's thicker in the back, and it gets thinner, and it starts to get thick right here in the middle. This is called the swell. And if you want a power swing, you usually reach back behind the swell, grab, and you come from your shoulder, and it's a, it's a whiplash action. You get a lot more power out of your swing if you do it like that. And what I'm going to do is some fine work, so I'm going to jump up to the swell. It'll be right here, and you'll see me do that. You'll see me actually go from here up to the swell and finish this piece out. fire. We've burned off a lot of the impurity. You don't see very much smoke anymore. Uh, you do see just plain coke burning. That's nice. You know, so I'm not sitting here coughing and gagging on sulfur. Uh, and you wouldn't have to be either. But here we are ready to go. Finish the taper. See, if you use that swell, you've got a lot more control. got a nice taper. Okay. So again we're going to go in, we're going to heat this, we're going to round the edges, and then we'll use this and turn the rat tail four times. Uh, potters make lots of pots. <laughs> Cabinet makers make lots of cabinets. Blacksmiths make tons and tons and tons of hooks. There's a hook for everything. And historically at least, Wherever you were working in a forge, somebody somewhere needed something made that was a hook shape. So that's one of the reasons why I started with this today. Would have you start with it, particularly I, I, when I teach, I have a student make a hook because it really, you're going to make a lot of hooks in your lifetime. My, the person who taught me years ago said, you'll probably make over a million hooks by the time you've done this in 10 years and you won't even know it. He was right about that. Well, we're ready to, to round it again. Let's go from square to round. Turn. Oh, yeah. And yeah, we're there. Okay, now, so when we make an S hook, what I like to do, what I teach to do is, you see we got the, the high eye going this way, we're going to reverse that and go the other way. And I'll show you why in a minute, because we're going to make one hook do this, and the other hook's going to do this. Okay. I still make hooks, thousands of them. <laughs> I make hooks for everybody and all kinds of people. Um, I make hinges, I make door latches, I make gates, I make railings, I make yard stuff, I make uh, hanging things, chandeliers. If it's made out of iron, we make it and my neighbors usually come dragging over a broken plow or a busted disc and they're trying to get something in the field and they can't fix it, so I end up making discs and plow parts, getting them back in business in about a day or so. They're happy about that. They don't have to wait on John Deere to send them the parts in a week. So blacksmiths still have a place today. We're still working. Um, we're still getting things done for repair. Okay, so we've gone this way on the hook. We're going to go the other way. And down we go. Curl it in. Bring it down. And we've got the second one. Alright, so while we've still got a little bit of heat, we're going to walk back to our bick and we use the, the pin of the hammer and just kind of gently coax it over. Just like that. Isn't that neat? Okay. We'll get another heat, finish that hook out, and then we'll do the other side. Of course, when you get into this, you start making all kinds of things, and you start thinking about things you might want, might need. Um, some of the very first things I made when I was a teenager were things to cook with, because I was a Boy Scout. We had a troop, and we uh, did a lot of outdoor cooking. So 
We made forks, spoons, ladles, spatulas, all that kind of stuff. Cooking crates. So just thank you guys for making um, a lot of your own tools if you wanted to. You're actually cooking over an open fire. All right, let's finish our hook. Now you notice I'm holding this at an angle. You see that? The reason why I'm doing that is because the horn is shaped at an angle, and if you want it to go straight, actually you want to go at an angle. Okay, you turn it over, repeat that, and it brings it back into round, which is what you want. Okay, so we're around there. Okay, that's about where I want it. Now we'll go ahead and cool that, and I'm going to heat the other part and make our S. All the trades on planet Earth, blacksmithing is one of the neatest, um, I think, because not everybody makes their tools. Uh, some some trades, some people can make their own tools, but in this trade, in blacksmithing, we make everything. Um, we make our own hammers, we make our own tongs, we make a lot of our other equipment that we need, and of course, we fix all the tools that get broken. So. And we make our own forges. And, um, you look around all these forges, uh, all these vices. I made them, and made them so that we could uh, teach with. So that's just an example. You can make a lot of your tools. Uh, the key to it is you just have to take your time and think about what you want to make. Draw a picture and think about how you're going to forge it. So let's take this all over. To it. We're going to heat it up one more time and we're going to finish it out and get a nice, nice radius. Um, hope you like math. If you like math, you'll love blacksmithing. If you don't like math, you'll still like blacksmithing. But I, you know, when I went to high school, I didn't really like algebra. I couldn't get it, I fought with it. Uh, when I got to geometry and I got to do math and I'd already been doing this, I could see radius and angle and square and all of those things. And then all of a sudden, the light bulb went off and math made sense. So if you really, really want to make math make sense, this is a great way to do it. So I'm going to turn the rest of this partial radius. Then I think I'm going to let Mr. Neal step in with some Play-Doh and show you some things that you can do in your home without a fire. Until you hit one. Now, I could be a bad guy, and I could tell you how when I was just getting started, I made my first forge. I would probably make your mother really mad if I did that. Um, Mom, you'll have to forgive me. It's, I've got to tell the truth, and I'm going to lie about it. Um, my mother had a vacuum cleaner, and it was an old vacuum cleaner, and it was really easy. All I had to do was reverse it. I just took the hose out of one end and put it out of the outgoing end. You know what? You made a great air source. Uh, you don't have to do that. You can use a hair dryer too these days. But there's a lot of things that you can make air with, and you can actually, you know, you know heat your metal with, heat your coal with. Okay, we're ready to finish it. There we go. And over it goes. that when you go camping again you can hang your pot on that put a string on it hang it over the fire you got your s hook okay so that's just some some basic blacksmithing some really really basic things you can do i did drawing i did fullering i did square to round and then i went from square to octagon and then to round um, if you get into blacksmithing one of the main principles you learn as a blacksmith is something called s or square to octagon to round most of what you do will be doing that. You take uh, your material, make it square, draw your lines, 
after you get your lines drawn and you establish what you want to do, then you go to octagon round, uh, round to octagon, and then back to round again, and you finish out your piece. So um, that's what I wanted to show you today, just to kind of whet your appetite about things you can do with blacksmithing.